All right, so let's get started. Um, good morning and afternoon and good evening, depending uh, where you are. Uh, this is our sixth Zoom event uh, with our China chapter. Uh, my name is Daniel from uh, today. We have a guest speaker, Mark Schaub, um, who is going to do the topic why joint ventures are on the rise in China. Uh, Mark's been a corporate lawyer since the 90s. And he's with law firm KWM, and he's been with the company since uh, 2000. And uh, yep, before we hand it off to Mark, I just want to add a note um, that feel free to ask questions to Mark as he's presenting. Uh, you can also throw your questions in the chat box and they can collect there, where I, I can also be asking those questions to Mark. So without further delay, Mark, I'll let you lead. Okay. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, hi, everybody. I'll just um, see if that works. Okay, so I guess everybody, Daniel, you can see the screen, is that right? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks everybody. So like Daniel mentioned, you know, I've actually been working as a lawyer in Shanghai since 93 and uh, I joined KWM in 2000. And I normally spend my time now since 2018 between Europe and China, but obviously, I don't get to leave the house at the moment. I'm stuck in London. So over that time, since the early 90s, we've been involved in a lot of joint venture uh, cases. Okay. So I think, you know, just, uh, uh, just to reiterate what Daniel said, please feel free just to interrupt, uh, ask a question, or say that you have a different experience. Very happy to have a bit of a dialogue. So I think when I was first there in China, in the early 90s, we did see quite a lot of joint ventures in China, but it was often, you know, I was working at a German law firm back then, and most of our clients were in the auto industry. And so the auto industry was really a place where Volkswagen came in, and then later companies like Daimler, BMW, General Motors. And it was not just those companies were joint ventures because of legal restrictions, but also a lot of um, companies were coming in uh, because they thought they needed to secure the supply chain or they wanted to have the local market know-how of the Chinese partner, you know, dealing with local officials and things like that. And so I think um, a few years later, um, people weren't interested in doing joint ventures because a lot of the joint ventures, they failed uh, after a certain period of time. And now I think the world's changed again. So early on, people were doing joint ventures because they thought it was a good way to start making things for export or you know, to sell to businesses who are making things in China. Later, people were doing wholly foreign-owned enterprises because they felt they could do it by themselves to manufacture. And now I think in the last five years or so, we've seen that China's not just an importer of capital, but it kind of creates things as a massive market and also exports capital. And yeah, you know, we've also had maybe in the last 10 years, the rise of private equity <laughs> and these companies are finding difficulty in finding new projects. So what we are seeing now is foreign companies, a lot of them are high tech companies, either US or European companies, and they're looking to do a smart joint venture. So it's not a joint venture, which is just because they think they need a Chinese partner or they need a competitor. They're looking for a good partner who can really give them some really useful technology, some innovation, maybe also some overseas distribution. But crucially, the main thing is they're looking uh, for someone that can make them, uh, that they can do together a successful business on the Chinese market. And so nowadays, I think if we look at our you know, international clients, almost 90% you know, of them, if they're coming to China, they're targeting the Chinese economy. They're not trying to export anymore. And so I think we've got a few clients at the moment who are working on joint ventures with large Chinese, very successful companies, because they think, it's better to have, say, 25% or 30% of a successful joint venture because they can handle the US or Europe by themselves, but they feel that China, it's too big to ignore, but a bit too difficult for them to handle by themselves. So for this reason, I think we're seeing a lot more joint ventures again. So I won't spend much time on the joint venture uh, per se, but you know, basically it's quite simple. It's you know, really a foreign entity and a Chinese entity enter into a joint venture. Um, there's a few different forms. Uh, there's an equity joint venture, a cooperation joint venture. 
I've only ever seen one cooperation joint venture and they're typically for real estate plays. So I think they're relatively, uh, yeah, they are relatively rare, but almost all joint ventures are equity joint ventures. And I think Thanks, this Mark. list of the, sorry. Mark, uh, can I just jump in for a quick question? Just, just curiosity. I think, um, you know, the first slide you mentioned in the early 90s, obviously, it's a very different time in China as compared to now. I think what they were looking for in China was technology, cash, and obviously um, manufacturing know-how, right? I mean, it's definitely yeah. played out over the last 30 or 40 years or so. Today, you know, with China, it's a much different economy, very sophisticated technology. What do they need over there? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so look, I think what they're looking at is, um, the, the sectors that are hot in China are also hot for, so China is, I think, the second largest importer of foreign technology in the world. So this includes license fees in this. And so if I'd say what we see the most of, it's digital tech, it's uh, life sciences and healthcare, and it's um, you know um, services of software companies. All these companies are coming to China and they often need to be adapted. So just yesterday we had a call with a services a software provider who's successful in Europe, but they do something for an insurance claim type of software system. So they've got a Chinese partner and they'll basically cooperate. The Chinese partner will handle distribution and also product localization because obviously the market's not the same. So I think we're seeing a lot of that. I don't think that we see many of the traditional joint ventures. You know, you do you know, like, you know, like manufacturing of a car or furniture. It's much less that. I think most of the joint ventures we see have a technology uh, element. And I think the thing is, it's uh, the Chinese uh, partners have become, I don't want to say arrogant, but they become much more self-assured. So 10 or 15 years ago, if you were an American company or a German company or a Swedish company, the Chinese were you know, very respectful. Nowadays, it's much more like, well, what, what technology have you got? Why is it better than what we've got? And so, you know, we've had a few clients who really thought their fintech was really great, but you know, they couldn't impress the Chinese side. Or, you know, someone who thinks WhatsApp is better than WeChat, very hard to convince people. So I think there's lots and lots of scope. And I think probably the biggest single sector is life sciences, healthcare, old age care, those kind of things. That's what's really uh, driving the market. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Um, here, I think when you look at the joint venture, the main issues, it used to be longer, but it's really more about the shareholder ratio because this will affect the composition of the board, you know, liquidation in the worst case. So you really have to know if you're a 60-40 or a 50-50 joint venture, or like I just you know, mentioned, you know, that one yesterday, which we were talking to, they're looking to do 25-30% of the joint venture, and they actually want the Chinese partner who interestingly enough is actually a Sino foreign joint venture. They want them to take the ball and run with it. They just want to, you know, protect their IP and some other issues. And then I think, you know, after the shareholding ratio, probably one of the issues is about 51 to 50, uh, 49. I think for foreigners, if they really want this, it's always a little bit weird. It's often if you've got a large state-owned company or listed partner, they will really want 51% because of the consolidation. So they want to put the financial results into their balance sheet. And so the next big issue is the board of directors and the management. So these are the kind of issues that we see get discussed you know, quite a bit. So I'll run through these very quickly. Um, but you know, when we look at a structure, I think one of the first questions I'd ask myself is, is this a state-owned company that's my partner? Are they um, going to insert any uh, or contribute any state-owned assets? Um, you look at the joint venture contract, how best to protect yourself. But, you know, I'm not a great believer in contracts. I think you need a contract. The contract should, you know, contain safeguards, but it's more important to have the right partner with a bad contract than a great contract with a bad partner. So obviously the best is if you have a good partner with a good contract, but make sure the documentation, it's realistic, that it's not, um, you know, that you have things that you can't enforce. You know, an example is you still see people who try to do contracts in China with, you know, New York law and New York courts. Obviously, for a joint venture in China, that's not even legally possible. But like a New York court judgment is almost impossible to enforce in China. So it's probably better to have Hong Kong arbitration or, you know, even CATEC arbitration. 
On management, I think just because it's a bit of a diverse um, audience, I think the issue is um, Anglo-Saxon companies who invest in China, they will often have a hierarchical management structure, at least the ones which we see, where they have a general manager and then maybe a deputy general manager. Whereas European companies will often have what we call an XCOM. And so the XCOM will have the general manager who's perhaps got overall responsibility, but he's just the captain of a team and then different people have different rights. So that might be something to think about. I think the XCOM actually, if it's a big joint venture, it can actually work better because there's more of a dynamic of cooperation rather than the hierarchical approach. So that's just something for people to think about. And then I think the you know, intellectual property is important. How do you value it? Uh, there are restrictions on how much can be the IP, but there's ways to get around it if people want to discuss that. Uh, important is to establish your IP rights in China. You know, except for copyright, other rights have to be established. So if you want patents, you're going to have to register them there, trademarks. Make sure you own it. And, you know, if the joint venture is going to adjust it, you want to make sure that you own those adjustments or at least you get a royalty-free, exclusive, irrevocable right to use those, uh, you know, additional improvements overseas. And then equity transfers. Um, I just put it in there because a lot of people ask about this. But there's at the moment, there's really no easy silver bullet. It's not like you can have this call or put option. These things all make sense, but you have to be very, very realistic between what you write on paper and what you can enforce. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, but you know, so I think it's very important when you do the contract in China, it shouldn't just look good on paper. You should think how it could practically work for your benefit if you had a dispute or if you were in a struggle with the partner. Okay. Okay, if there's no questions on that slide, I'll continue. So compliance, I think, is a big issue. We still have it, especially with US clients, I think more than the European clients. And so there's a lot of concerns when you're doing due diligence. And I think sometimes with joint ventures, it's a bit difficult because, you know, the most suspicious company I ever found when we we're doing due diligence was a Chinese privately owned company that had a hundred percent record of compliance. And so I really thought we must have missed something, but it was explained to us that the owner wanted to do an IPO with this company. So from the very start, he did everything in a perfect compliant way. So I think if you're gonna do a joint venture or you're gonna buy into a Chinese privately owned company, you have to make a distinguishment, a, a distinguish between like toxic non-compliance, you know, or compliance that you can correct and improve. Uh, another issue is the operational qualifications. We're doing a project at the moment, which is in a very restricted area, and it's very difficult to get the operational licenses. So one of the big issues for the client will be, there's no guarantee, even if they do a share deal and they buy the company, that those operational licenses, because they're subject to shorter renewals than the lifespan of the joint venture, whether or not that operational license may be difficult to renew. So we've also had those kind of uh, cases as well. Uh, on the rest, I think the approvals and that stuff, it's all kind of clear. You just will need approvals or filing. Some things are off limits. Some things are encouraged. Most things are uh, permitted. And I'd say the trend you know, since the 90s has been to liberalization. But a bit like the first question, what are the hot areas? You, know, you can guess what the sensitive areas are. They will be things like um, um, media, um, certain types of training, certain types of value-added telco services. So, you know, if you're in a business that could be sensitive or slightly sexy, it's more likely that it might be restricted. But then there might be things that you're not expecting. Like I was surprised, it's very hard to do anything in rice or do corn crushing plants. So these were things which I didn't think were difficult, but these are also very restricted. And so the last point, which I should really put at the end, not you know, approvals, but is about exit. And I think the thing is joint ventures do have a lifespan. And I know that people don't like to think about it, but you know it will end. And so even at the start, you should start thinking about how to strategically put yourself in the best position for the eventual exit. Now, this might sound a little bit shocking to some people. I'd say the average lifespan of a joint venture is about 10 years. So it's about the same as an octopus or something. So you know some will fail earlier, you know, 
normally maybe like seven years. It's, it's rare for them to fail earlier than that, or they fail very quickly, or they can last longer. But, you know, I think at some stage, you know, the partners, the Chinese and the foreigners, why'd they come together? Normally the foreigner was interested in the Chinese market and the Chinese partner was interested in the technology or the investment or something. And so over time, these interests no longer align. And, you know, we've had cases where a German company did a joint venture with a Chinese company uh, maybe 12 years ago. And when it started, the Chinese company was quite small. And today the Chinese company is six times larger than the German company. And so the joint venture, the Chinese partner wants more and more technology, wants to expand the products of the German partner, but the German partner wants to still have its own products and only wants to stick on that. And so that joint venture ended up going apart and strange, you know, perhaps, you know, um, the relatively rare occurrence never used to happen, happens more often now than it used to, the Chinese partner bought out the Germans' interest in that joint venture. So think about the exit, and um, we might touch on a bit, or someone might have a question. One thing about these technology companies, a lot of them are looking for an IPO in China as the exit because of the Star Exchange, which is like China's NASDAQ, has been you know, just hurtling along, collecting so much capital. So that's an exit. Whereas 10, 20 years ago, there was no exit plan. It was like, we'll do a joint venture. And I don't know, the exit plan is we'll just keep on doing the joint venture. Now, I think people have perhaps a few more ideas. So I think dealing with your partners, and obviously every joint venture is unique. Every joint venture partner is different. But I think you know, a few main issues are, yeah, don't be in full, full by guanxi, which is, you know, I've got all these great connections. I've got all these great relationships. It's true that relationships are important in China. It's also true that they're important in America or in the uh, UK or anywhere. So you know, make sure you get the right partner. Don't be fooled by a beautiful story. I think the other one is a bit about flexibility. I think if you're a medium-sized family business and you make all the decisions and nobody ever queries you, you may not be the right person to do a joint venture with a Chinese partner. Um, make sure you really work out the stakeholder analysis. So this again, I mean, everything is bespoke. It's different if you've got your market and you're selling, but let's say if you're setting up the joint venture because you're trying to sell to a sector which is difficult, like say the railway industry, because even though it's open for procurement to a degree, you often need in order to succeed in a tender, you must be a joint venture, for example. So really work out is, is your joint venture, do you not just satisfy the Chinese partner, but are all the stakeholders happy with the concept? And then I, I guess the, the other issue is about clarifying the decisions right uh, yeah, at, the, at the start. And this is often a lot of joint ventures because a lot of the joint ventures are done in engineering um, type companies. And so engineers often lead it. And sometimes the engineers they get frustrated with lawyers saying, we need to really you know, make this very clear. And they'll say, let's sign it now and we'll work out the details later. This is very difficult. So I think you know, it's really important to make sure everybody's aligned on what's the decision-making process, the roles and the responsibilities. You, know, you don't want to find out that there's a real non-alignment after you've half built the factory. So I think these are just you know, obviously common sense but some of the things we've seen. Um, okay, I might skip that. I might say that too. So I think which joint ventures work successfully? I think perhaps the ones which work most successfully is where you do have the alignment. And you know, a joint venture contract, it's you know signed, you know, maybe it's got 20 years, maybe it's got 50 year term, but it's signed on day one. And you know. Very rarely do people change it very much unless they're increasing the registered capital or they're doing something very small. So it is a bit unusual that the joint venture is such a static document. And so I think by its nature, since the joint venture is very static, I try to put things which are more dynamic into annexes which don't need to be approved and filed in public. So things like the management bylaws and things like that. And then I think also the business plan is very important to make sure that you continue being aligned as the market changes. Because we'll talk a little bit later a bit about why joint ventures sometimes have problems. 
And I think one of the reasons why they have problems, or not one of the reasons, 70% of joint ventures that have problems, it's an economic problem. And then it feeds into a cultural problem and then it feeds into a shareholder dispute. So I think, you know, make sure you're aligned on things like what's the focus of the joint venture? What products you're doing? Are you trying to increase your revenue or are you trying to maximize your profit? How short term are you? How long term are you? What's the capability transfer? What are you trying to keep offshore? What are you trying to bring over? And, you know, how are you actually doing the technology transfer? Um, and then finding the right partner, like I said, it's really the most important thing is the right partner. With the right partner, you can solve most problems. But, you know, if you have a bad partner, no contract will really help you. No. I mean, obviously, it will help you somewhat, but it's better to have the right partner from the start. Um, I think also people now have to get up, give up the idea that they're always in charge, that, you know, it's a you know, 51, 49 joint venture, but you've got 100% of the say, or you're going to tell everybody how to direct traffic. Uh, I think in some cases, uh, you might want to give up control to the stronger Chinese partner, and you're more of the technology, you know, perhaps international flair, but, you know, they can really drive the business. You keep on adding value, but you actually create a very valuable business in China. I think another issue is the right team and the governance. So you need to have China capability, I think. And I think head office needs to be involved because I've never really understood how you can have a successful joint venture if head office just allows the people on the ground to do everything and they're never really involved. I think that it's not really a sensible joint venture. So I think, you know, you'd really would like head office to have some role, you know, visit regularly, attend board meetings, and really work out how to bring the business forward. Um, Daniel, I don't know, I see somewhere at the top, it's got like seven. I don't know if they're questions or something else. I, I didn't want to open it in case I did something. Will you read the questions as we go along or are you going to uh, save them up, Daniel, just to have a trust? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can ask some right now. Uh, um, well, uh, one here is, is it possible for a foreign partner? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Be, 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 uh, uh, the, the GP. Okay, so Daniel, you're breaking up for me. I don't know if others can hear. I, I, I think I've successfully opened up the and, JV. And is. Yeah, so so I think, you know, in the cases on the GP, uh, this is a new one, which I, I, I which I think is that it is possible. Uh, I, I don't think that the Chinese part, it would depend on what sector you're in, uh, but I think it's not necessarily an issue of... Uh, of the Chinese always having to be the GP. I think another one is somebody wrote, uh, Steve Schnell wrote, he was in General Motors uh, when they did the JV and they were mandated to form a JV. Now, so that's a very interesting example. And I think we've got it here. We've got General Motors in sight. And also, you know, all those auto companies, Tesla was able to negotiate a new deal. So, and our firm, I wasn't involved, but our firm in Shanghai was involved in it. Uh, but for a long time, China had restrictions. It was, I think, the two plus two restrictions. So not only could you not get more than 50% of a passenger car or a commercial truck uh, joint venture, but you were also limited to two joint ventures in two categories. Uh, so that was a big restraint on the foreign companies. But I think now, um, as China has become uh, more um, confident about its own ability to be an innovator in the automotive space. And as perhaps the gas type uh, cars are, are leaving and we're looking at new energy vehicles, you actually will see that China has recently um, loosened the restrictions so that foreign partners can own a majority in those kind of joint ventures. Because I think this is just an indication when China's auto industry was very weak, they wanted to make sure that the joint ventures were 50-50 and also that there were forced technology transfers back then. But as they become more confident, uh, they're much more happy 
to have it. And I think probably they think the old gasoline style motors are probably the old type of business. And so they're much more interested in electrical vehicles and also things like autonomous cars. So I'll, I'll keep going. I'll try and keep an eye on those chats. Uh, but I don't know if I can always see them. So just here, I think joint ventures that work successfully, a lot of them are big ones. So, you know, Airbus, BP, GM, you know, Volkswagen. And so I think one of the reasons is if you're a big company in the West and you're doing a joint venture with a big company in China, it may not be a great romantic love story, but you have the resources to deal with it. You have, you know, it's, it's like a corporate type of big deal. Um, I think, you know, we have medium-sized companies do successful joint ventures, but that's often that the management really does get on well with the Chinese partner and they've built up perhaps first a supplier relationship before they did a joint venture together and there's some human element of it. I think perhaps the most difficult joint ventures are large companies, which are not as big as these giants, but they try to do joint ventures with partners who are quite different from them and it's quite difficult. So, you know, I think joint ventures that work successfully is where the partner is in some ways a bit similar to you. Okay, I don't know what's happening now. Okay, and so I think we segue now from joint ventures that were successful to the ones that blow up. And so I think, um, look, almost every joint venture I've done, which makes it sound like it might be my fault, but almost all of them that we did in the 90s, something has happened. There's one or two which are still joint ventures and they're still doing okay. But I even think in those cases, something will happen at some stage. <clears throat> so I think it's quite normal to have problems and we'll talk a bit about why it's normal to have problems. And I think in 30% of the cases, the joint venture contract, life changed, the economy changed, maybe the factory had to move, maybe the business. You know, we had a client who was doing a joint venture to do the old style TVs with the tubes. You know, that disappeared within six months. You know, it was, it was strange. You had like the old TVs and six months later, everything was a flat screen TV. So that joint venture just, you know, disappeared very quickly. So 30% of the joint ventures, you know, there's a problem. You can diffuse it. You can realign. You can maybe, you know, buy them out. You might do something. Then there's another 50%, which is more serious. There's economic issues and you need to have a more serious corporate restructuring. So it might not be just changing the management around a bit. Maybe the foreign partner has to take a clear lead. Maybe he takes 70 or 80%. Maybe he buys you out. Maybe the Chinese buy, uh, partner buys you out. Maybe you buy them out and they remain as a distributor. Lots of different things. Uh, this is the less happy version than the 30%. But then I would say, and this is not scientific, maybe about 20% of joint ventures just explode and it's a big mess. And these need some creative planning to get out of. And so the whole slide doesn't show up here, but I think the whole idea is here, when we talk about the strategic alignment, I think the problem is, if you didn't really align when you were negotiating and signing, then these problems tend to come back later. And the Chinese say, same bed, different, different dreams. And I think this is an issue. It can be about compliance. It can be about marketing. It can be about the use of, ex, uh, of expats. It can be about the import equipment. It can be about whether the joint venture can export to a third market. It can be about your technology. There's lots of things that can go wrong if the interests diverge. And this is often the case if you hadn't actually really worked out what you want to do before you started the joint venture. And so, you know, this slide, I won't go into great detail, but it's a simple slide and it's about sand in the machine. So, you know, we set up the joint venture and we have to realize the joint venture is a separate legal entity from the shareholders. Um, but you know, all of them, I mean, almost any joint venture has a divided board and a different and a divided management. So perhaps the foreign shareholder uh, nominates the general manager, 
the Chinese uh, shareholder nominates the deputy general manager. The board might have six directors, three from the foreign side, three from the Chinese side. And then I think you know, the most common issue is we have economic difficulties. And then it's often the Chinese partners who are more upset than the foreign partners. And very often the Chinese partners feel the joint venture have lost their way. And then they might commence competitive entities or activities, or they might complain. And the reason why I say it's often the Chinese partners that will start this complaining is because it was often the foreigners who insisted that they'd have to be the managers of the business. And so when there's economic difficulties, you tend to blame the managers. And then I think once we have this problem and people are arguing, a joint venture is really a bad uh, system to come to an arrangement. So, you know, first thing is, you know, after the shareholders, we'd have the board. There's no goodwill at the board. Then we have the management is in dispute because the management is nominated by different parties. Then we have the breakdown at the shareholder level. And then we actually just basically have gridlock. Things might continue to work, but it's very, very hard to get momentum to make big changes. And this is the difficulty when you have a joint venture dispute. So I, I think I've already mentioned it very briefly before, but yeah, what's the biggest mistake after the lack of strategic alignment is the idea of total control. And you know, I remember one client years ago said, I must have 51%. And it was a Danish company. I said, well, why do you need 51%? Is it a financial issue, an accounting issue? He said, no, I need 51% because I need total control. And at the time I said to him, well, if you want total control in a joint venture, maybe you should have a wholly foreign owned enterprise where you own 100%. Um, actually, by now, I'm not sure you even have total control if you have 100% wholly foreign owned enterprise in China. So I think the issue is really with that 5149, maybe at the margins there's something, but really if you think that you have one or 2% more that you really have the critical say, that won't help you. If anything, these joint ventures are even more difficult to unwind because one side feels they have rights, which I don't think they really will be able to enforce in practice. Okay, so mistake number two is playing the game. And I think, you know, just very, you know, briefly on this, because I hope we can have time to have discussion and people, please feel free to reach out. It's just that Daniel, I couldn't actually hear him. I think his connection wasn't that good. But I think the issue is when we have a dispute, um, it's how people play the game. And I think, you know, a joint venture is a very complicated issue. And the first thing that people will have when they have a joint venture dispute is they will look at that old joint venture contract as if it will contain some secrets that will be a map out of the mess. And, you know, of course, you have to look at the joint venture contract, but just restricting yourself to the joint venture contract it's really like just playing noughts and crosses. And you know, noughts and crosses is a game where if you have any level of intelligence, you should really not lose. You know, it should always be a draw. But often international companies who you know, deal with the joint venture dispute as if they're playing noughts and crosses, they actually even lose at noughts and crosses because you know, they make such obvious mistakes. So I think it's more like a chessboard. And that means the joint venture contract's important. But so are the board resolutions, the emails, the supplier arrangements, and you know, all these different things between the parties. Uh, why are you valuable to the Chinese party? What's the role of the local government? You know, it's much more complicated. There's a lot more moving pieces. And that will give you a much better chance of getting a, a good solution. But to tell you the truth, if you really want an opt optimal solution, the game on the end there from the Big Bang Theory is something called four-dimensional chess. And so I think beyond just the joint venture, you really have to look at where's the leverage points over the Chinese party, uh, anticipate what they're going to do, because that's the other issue, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute, is that very often the Chinese partner is in China, mean, well, always the Chinese partner is in China, and very often the decision makers are in the US, and it takes a long time, and it's very reactive. So I think you need to be able to move quickly, on a number of different levels and think beyond just the joint venture, look at the other relationships you have, look at what is your best case alternative. People sometimes fight for years on a joint venture 
but they never set up their own wholly foreign owned enterprise or something, something which could change the leverage dynamic. So the pirate captain, and I think people sometimes think it's a joke about the pirate captain, but I think if you've got a joint venture, it's different than if you're operating a joint venture, which is going smoothly. So if you have a joint venture dispute, you need somebody who's not the same as a general manager. And you know, very often the general manager and perhaps the Chinese deputy general manager, these two have been fighting with each other for a number of years. So it's very difficult to get them to solve the problem. And so why I use the word pirate captain is because in the old pirate ships, the quartermaster was in charge of the pirate ship of the administration, and he would like run the show when things were normal. The pirate captain would be you know, getting drunk in his galley or whatever, and he'd only come out when the ship was attacking somebody or was under attack. So I think you need a different type of personality uh, to deal with the dispute than the person who runs the company normally. And so you need to have somebody who you know, is either very experienced uh, but has won the trust of your company and yeah, should be unconnected to the business because there's really a big problem with you know, inherent bias. You know, um, if I'm an American company and I've appointed the American general manager, it's difficult for them to be neutral about what mistakes the American company might have made towards the Chinese side. They just always say it's all the Chinese are wrong. You know, so I think the, it's someone neutral and understands how to deal with a, a dispute and is able to make a quick decision on things. And then like information gathering, I think this is also the thing which is important. I've never found something very useful in a joint venture contract. I found a lot of useful stuff in emails. I found a lot of useful stuff in other contracts. And nowadays, if you can get access to it, you can find a lot of interesting stuff in WeChat messages. Because I think if you look at these kind of information, you can see like the joint venture contract is a static thing which happens in one place in time. If you look at a year of WeChat messages, you can kind of see with the benefit of hindsight where people were starting to do things wrong or they were doing things incorrectly or where they were, where things didn't line up with reality. So I think it's very important to gather the information don't trust what people give you. We've had lots of cases where the, 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 the management from the foreign side told us stuff. And when we actually did some digging, we found that the information was just not true. Um, also in China, you can get a lot of information from the, um, uh, the SAIC, uh, now they're called SAMR, uh, and they've got the corporate records. Normally, if you're a Chinese lawyer, you can just pick up those records, get a scanned version. And they can have a treasure trove of information. So I think it's important to get independent objective sources and also collect as much information as possible. And you should do this before people realize there is a dispute. Because once you start with a dispute, a lot of stuff will go missing. The fourth mistake is you know, the inability to set a realistic target. So I would say most foreign people who come to me or clients, and you know, they tell me they've got this dispute with the Chinese partner. You know, maybe the Chinese partner's kicked them out of the building. Maybe the Chinese partner is not paying them for any um, outstanding orders, which the joint venture's given to the Chinese partner. Uh, maybe the, the, the Chinese partner has taken over the management or something. And you say to them, and you say, okay, and you listen to this sad story, and you say, well, what do you want to do about it? And normally, I'd say the most common answer I get is, well, I would like the Chinese partner to comply with the joint venture contract. Now, this is not very realistic. You know, it's not a realistic target. So I think before you do it, work out what do you really want to do? What do you think you can do? Do you want to get out of the joint venture because it's non-compliant? Do you want to get out of the joint venture so you can start a new Chinese business and you're stuck in an exclusivity? Do you want to decouple the joint venture from the Chinese business? Do you want to get your IP and your you know, production equipment, which has got all the IP in it, do you want to get that out of China? So these are all kind of things that we've had clients and they were the motivating factors. And this made it easier to work out a strategy to succeed. Because if your only idea is, I want the Chinese partner to um, 
comply with my version of the joint venture, what I think it means, this is really, really very difficult to pull off. So um, I think the key takeaways here are, firstly, the most important thing I think is uh, finding the right partner. Uh, I think if you've got the right partner, you can work things out. And you know, the, the longest standing joint venture, which I've worked on, and I used to be a director of as well, that happened over uh, 20 years ago. They started with one joint venture. They've now got three joint ventures. It's between a relatively large privately owned German company and a you know, medium sized Chinese entrepreneur in Liaoning province. Uh, and they really have done well. Uh, he helped secure the local resources like the natural resources because it was a very specific type of product. <laughs> but they also relied on him for his ability to work out how distribution worked in China. And so it shows you these joint ventures can be very successful. And I think now if we're talking about the 2020s, um, you might find the appropriate partner is someone like a Baidu or somebody in the Star Exchange, a Chinese company that has got lots of money, you know, like a Tencent or Alibaba, you've got something which they would want, or, or I don't know, like a, a Newsoft or, there's lots of successful Chinese companies and you know they run appropriately. And I think they're very keen to find joint venture partners who have a really interesting concept and technology, which works well overseas, but if you could bring it to China, you could supersize that business and make it more successful. And so I think this is the kind of joint ventures we're seeing more and more of. I'd say the second thing is, it's, you should keep an open mind. The business practices, the culture and the customs, it's very different. I never used to think this. You know, I lived in China almost exclusively from um, 1993 until 2018. I didn't really leave very often. And I always didn't believe this cultural differences. But when I actually left China and came to Europe, I realized actually it was more of a culture shock for me than when I first went to China. I mean, because I knew that China was very different. Um, but there's all these little things that you don't realize. And a lot of the things which I always thought weren't true, like, you know, the importance of face and the importance of relationships, because I think, you know, Westerners also have these. They do matter, I think, a bit more in China and they're a little bit different. So it's not about reading a booklet or a paragraph about this, but it means that you have to perhaps be a bit flexible and try to do a bit of thinking like what's motivating the Chinese side. And then... I'm a lawyer, but I'll say something about lawyers. I'd say, if you're looking at joint ventures, don't make everything too difficult or too complicated or too hard. A joint venture contract is of a certain level of complexity. That's for sure. But sometimes I've seen so many things which I can just tell a boilerplate. They're not fit for purpose. It's wording that doesn't really make sense. I think it doesn't really work. So try to work out what you really want, have a reasonable document that protects your interest, but something that can actually evolve over time and also you know, the Chinese partner can live with. And so I think you need to be creative, focused, have the right kind of team and also keep headquarters involved. So Daniel, um, I was gonna just stop sharing the slides then and uh, you know, interested if there's questions. I don't know if I, I didn't know where the chat went now, but. If there's any questions, be very happy to engage in the discussion. So uh, I have a question hey, here. Um, okay, am I coming through clearly now, Mark? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Oh, yeah, now I think Jay you're on mute, on now. mute. So I'll read Jay's question. How do you protect your IP from a company like Tencent, who's the 800 pound panda in the relationship? So look, I think this isn't such a, I think this is, um, so hi to Jay. I understand he's in an airport coming back to China. So yeah, thanks for joining Jay. Look, I think the thing is, it's not gonna be the 10 cents of the world. I think if we look at IP, um, yeah, the biggest single problem with uh, foreign companies nowadays in China is they didn't establish or register the IP. I'm not gonna say that IP protection in China is fantastic, whatever. But I can say it's very different from 20 years ago. And our law firm is a Chinese law firm. 
and we have maybe like 3,000, 4,000 people in China, 13 offices, the single fastest growing part of our business is IP litigation. And so I think the first question is, what is your IP? If we're talking about patents or trademarks, register it. If you're a computer company, you don't need to register your software uh, as copyright because copyright just you know, is a, a right that just establishes itself globally. But if you spend the thousand US dollars to register it, it makes it easier to take action. It you know, shifts the evidentiary burden. And I think a company like Tencent, they're a very good target because they're so big, you know, a claim of an IP infringement by a Tencent would be a disaster for them. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of increased IP litigation. And most of it is Chinese companies against other Chinese companies is because a lot of companies now are listed or they're on the star exchange or they're planning an IPO and they can't afford to have an ID, IP dispute. So I think just in summarize, look at your IP, establish the rights, protect them, have a strategy, and then work out who you're dealing with. And I think it's not that bad in a joint venture, especially if you pick the right partner. Okay, I think someone else had a question or... Okay, uh, Mark, I'm not sure if I'm... I'm coming. Yes. Yeah. Clear. You know, Mark, I'll jump in since Dan uh, has some um, uh, here. connection. Am, am I Dan, maybe you, I, I've got the chat open. Maybe so you correct. could just write a little bit about your question because uh, I can't hear it. Please. My connection. I'll, I'll jump so, right. I just got a quick one. Cut. I just got a quick one. You, you know, so I think, you know, when you look at the last 30 or 40 years, you know, China's relationship with the U.S. and then China's relationship with the rest of the world, probably uh, at the current moment, it's not in its best terms. How, how is that going to affect some of the JVs that you've been talking about in the current environment, you know, with respect to uh, some of the sort of <clears throat> uh, international relationship China with respect to the rest of the, the world? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Look, I think it's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, I think what we've seen is, uh, China, as somebody else said before, has become an innovator and there's a lot of indigenous technology now. Uh, but you know, they're still behind in stuff like semiconductors. And I think the US was starting earlier about being concerned about it. So we saw a wave of acquisitions of semiconductor companies. And I always thought semiconductor companies were like Intel. I always thought they were like these massive billion dollar companies. But actually a lot of them, you know, it's such a fragmented business. Uh, so there was a lot of acquisitions in places like Holland and in Germany. And now the EU is also tightening it. I don't think it's as tough as the American. I mean, I don't think, I know it's not as tough as the Americans. Europe has been very open to Chinese investments until recently. Uh, at the moment, I think the main problem in Europe is if it's defense related. And we did actually have a Chinese acquisition into Germany where I think it was very unfair, but the German government stepped in and stopped it, uh, even though the, the documents were signed before the law came into effect and everything. So I think the, the issue will be the technology. And I think if it's something off limits for the Chinese company to buy the American company, there's going to be a lot of issues with licensing that technology to China as well. So I think we're just going to have to admit that certain types of technology, especially dual use defense technology, some telco stuff uh, may be too sensitive, but most stuff is no problem. And I think, it, I don't think many of our clients who are trying to do um, these kind of joint ventures with their tech, I don't think any of them are thinking this is a way to get around having a Chinese shareholder in the US. It's more like I'm busy doing the US I think I can do Europe, but China is too big. Why don't I just put my technology in and if they can do something with it, it might be worth a lot. And then at least, you know, I'm a bit involved, but I can concentrate on my core markets, which are easier for me. So I think that's kind of what we're seeing. Can I just ask, um, just uh, as a slight continuation of the previous question, um, because of the political situation with China being more assertive, 
with its foreign policy because of issues of IP theft, um, which a lot of Western companies are concerned about. Do you see a trend of Western companies actually deciding to either pull out of China or not invest any further in China and go to maybe India or uh, some of the Southeast Asian countries um, to, to set up production facilities there instead? So I think, look, um, I think the thing is, the, the stuff that I've actually seen, I mean, I've read in the newspapers all this stuff, I haven't seen any client pull out of China because of IP concerns. Um, I've seen people downsize, but I think everything I've seen has always been economic drivers. And so if you take something like the textile industry, it wasn't an IP issue. It was just that they thought it was cheaper to go to Bangladesh or you know, India as well. Um, I think probably I haven't met a client who said, because my IP is at risk, I'm gonna to go to India. We met clients who said, either we don't want, and this was back in SARS days, there was a few cases where people decided not to have all the eggs in the China basket because you know, that pandemic back then essentially um, hamstrung China. And so people didn't want to take the risk of having just one single place of sourcing their goods. Um, but I think now some of our clients who are in more you know, mass market commodities or whatever, some of them have started to source from India or Bangladesh and not exclusively from China, but it's economics. I really haven't met a company that says I'm pulling out of China because I'm worried about my IP. I just, uh, I think anyone who was worried about that, they wouldn't have set up in China. Yeah, that's probably the issue, you know. Okay, just um, <laughs> one more follow up question. Um, do you think the main reason Western companies want to invest in China is more cheaper production facilities or access to the Chinese market or both? And, and which of the two is the greater? It would have been from 1990 until about 2005, it would have been this concept, maybe 1990 until the early 2000s, it was the idea of a organized compliant workforce. We could manufacture for export, et cetera, or we're manufacturing for the Chinese guys. We make big things for Chinese companies that make smaller things and stuff like that. I'd say around 2005 or so, uh, everybody that I met was mostly interested in the Chinese market. And that would be even the like suppliers, the tier one suppliers for the automotive industry. They were wanting to supply the Chinese companies making the cars for the Chinese consumer. And then I would say, you know, after that, there was the next bump where people that wanted to supply the Chinese who were supplying everybody in the world. So, you know, one client was the company that does the railway, a certain part of a, a train. And one of the reasons they had to be in China was because they also wanted to supply China in Africa when they build the trains for Africa. So that was the other thing. And I'd say now, if I look at our business now and we look at new joint ventures, um, for every one which we have, which is like a manufacturing joint venture, we probably have 10 or 15, which are something like a cosmetics company, a digital company, a SaaS company, a uh, autonomous driving joint venture. All the joint ventures are all about the Chinese consumer market. And then there's the occasional one. The one which is not about the Chinese consumer is the outlier. It's a, you know, it could be something like a, a rare earth company because China has most of the rare earth in the world. But really, I don't think I've met anyone in the last 10 years who says, I want to build a factory in China because it's cheap to manufacture. But you know, that might be just the clients that we attract. But that's what we've seen over the, the years, I think. So I have a question from May, uh, who's going to unmute, and then I'm going to read Daniel's question. OK, yeah. Uh, hi, Mark. It was great uh, presentation. I have a question on the uh, CFIUS that if you can talk a little bit about that from U.S. perspective, because I, I work in the uh, pharmaceutical industry and trying to connect to some of the entrepreneurs. But the IP lawyers just asked me to stay away from this because of that. You know, so I just wanted to get your insights. OK, thank you. So, look, um, I, I am a lawyer, which means I'm bad, but I'm not I'm not a US lawyer, so I'm not totally a bad guy. So I'm not a US lawyer, so I, I can't really talk about CFIUS from the US perspective, uh, but I can just talk, you know, our law firm is a very large Chinese law firm. 
and we've helped many Chinese companies go abroad. And I, I would say, I would guess probably the amount of Chinese companies who are investing in the US, it's really dropped off 70, 80%. So uh, a lot of companies are very concerned and very often uh, the issues that clients have faced, and I haven't been involved in these projects, so I, I don't do it, but I, I just hear around the traps. It, it seems as if uh, it was hard to see that there was really a strategic problem with it. So I think, um, I think if I'm feeling this, the Chinese companies are feeling this very intently as well. So I think there's not much appetite. They're still trying to do it. And I think there's more IPOs in the pipeline from America than there used to be, even though, you know, all those other issues. But I think Cepheus was earlier and that was a pipeline. And so I think it's difficult. And even with, you know, the change of the administration in America, I don't think Chinese people are thinking it's going to be easy. I think they probably think Europe is an easier place to buy technology or invest in companies at the moment. So that would be my feeling. It's not something that's easy to overcome. But I think the other way is for the Chinese entrepreneurs, they might be, if you've got, um, I think you said you are life science or pharmaceuticals, you know, they, they could have a very big interest, not in investing in the company, but pharmaceuticals, it wouldn't be a um, prohibited technology or something, you know, overly sensitive. So it might be possible to do a licensing or do something with that where the Chinese funds it because I think then the Chinese will feel they've got much more control. It's much less risk. They don't have the foreign exchange issues. They know how to add value. So that's why I think joint venture, I should have actually mentioned that before. That's one of the other things I motivate is the joint venture is for these rich Chinese companies, it's easier to do it in China. No foreign exchange, no approvals, just do it. You know, it's easier for them. So Lisa uh, mentioned that she subscribes to your YouTube channel, China, um, Art of Law. I don't know if you want to you, Lisa. touch bless on that bless. at all. Um, but then Steve, I don't know if you answered this during the conversation. He was talking about General Motors. First He was the first managing director of Shanghai. Um, and he then Lisa also asked about Tesla. So did you touch on that? I think I did, but I mean, it'd be great to hear what Steve says about you know being at the coalface at General Motors, uh, it'd be very interesting to hear what he would comment on. Um. Well, the, the, the SAIC GM joint venture was the second vehicle venture that GM did. Uh, the first one was a complete disaster, but it was a mandated joint venture. And that mandated joint venture told us if we do that one, we could do cars. We started the project in 1992. I moved to Shanghai in 94, and we completed the joint venture in 97. We were by, fighting against uh, Toyota and Ford, and there happened to be a spy on the opposition side <laughs> working for Toyota. So anything we pr proposed, Toyota beat us on. Eventually, we won. It was a long, drawn-out process, but we had a large number of of people that knew how to deal with China. I had started working in China in 85, moved to Shanghai in 94, so I had a little experience. One of the strategies we did was to do components first, build up an infrastructure where you had parts available that met our standards. That showed we had good faith and we had some, uh, some good quality. So that led us to get into the vehicle business. Uh, we also had a very good lawyer who made sure there was no boil plate and all the terms were very easy to translate. Back when we were doing it, getting people to translate properly was a challenge. Uh, overall, it worked out pretty good. Uh, in terms of what Tesla is doing, uh, I think a lot of what we did back in, in the early and mid 90s opened the door for a lot of other people. You know, we were able to we had a good partner. They had some experiences, uh, not the best quality, but they knew how to, to do things. They also had connections within the, the central government, which also helped. Uh, Guangxi was, was very important, but having knowledge of the people, how to deal with the people, uh, and establishing your own relationships with your counterparts, that was extremely crucial to the whole process. 
overall it worked out very well. Uh, we, we started off at 50-50. Uh, then when GM had financial problems, uh, GM sold part of its equity to SAIC in order to get cash, but it's still profitable. And they they sell more Buicks in China than we do in the rest of the world. Well, that's a bit like uh, Shanghai Volkswagen. I think they never sold a Santana anywhere else outside of Shanghai. And so I think a lot of those automotive companies that somebody once asked me a question, like maybe 10 years ago, and I wasn't ready for the question because it just, I was very surprised. And it was somebody said to me, have you ever heard of a uh, joint venture or wholly foreign owned enterprise making money in China? And most of my clients in the early 90s were German companies and most of them were in the automotive industry and they never made as much money as they did in China through selling semi knockdown kits, the components. They were making so much money, it was you know, incredible. So I guess it was just being in the right business at the right time. You know? But when we tried to go in, uh, we were not allowed to do a knockdown kits. It had to be manufacturing. We started off with 60% Chinese content from day one. Yeah. And we increased it from there. Yeah. And then in 2017, we had the first exports of Buicks from China to the US. So it, it took 20 years to, to export the vehicles, but it worked. Yeah. No, but I think, I think it's instructive what you say. It was, you know, firstly, you had the right partner, even if they're a little bit difficult, we also did some work with um, Ally uh, 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 you know, when they sold out their auto financing and SAIC and yep. GM border. So we were working with those guys. So it was like an ambitious Chinese company, but it is a bit like dealing with the state. So it's not like a private entrepreneur. You, you kind of, it's got its own challenges, the process of making a decision. But I think, you know, it's really important what you say too, is how to get to know the people, build a relationship with the people. And I think a lot of people forget it. And also that contract in the Volkswagen negotiations, I wasn't there because that was a bit earlier than me, uh, but my boss who was there, he was the first deputy general manager of Volkswagen, even though he was a lawyer. And uh, they had a guy, maybe you dealt with him, they called him, the nickname was Shakespeare. So SAIC's lawyer who was uh, doing the contracts, he was called uh, Shakespeare. And the contract, I saw the joint venture contract for Volkswagen, it's like 12 pages long. It was. I mean, it was too short, even by my standards, but yeah, it was kind of interesting. Well, I so, think our joint venture contract was probably close to uh, several hundred pages, but there was an awful lot of technology that was included in there. Okay. These were in the annexes, but anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry. So, so, so I'm going to ask uh, Jay's question before I ask Daniel's, just in case Jay has to jump on his plane. <laughs> and he asked, recently I was told for the first time in modern history, China surpassed the U.S. for FDI. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, I don't know when it was. It would have been, I don't know if it was, really, it was recently. There was a year where China was number one. And, you know, it's like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, China invested, you know, nothing. You know, And the scale goes on that. And I think this, again, goes to that joint venture reason. Yeah, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, nobody thought China would invest overseas. And then I think probably it was like the high point for our law firm, I think would have been around 2018, I would guess, 2017. And there, I remember there is a point where China exported more cash than imported in foreign FDI. And, you know, I think that would have been the time when uh, China surpassed the US, but it would have been only in that year. I don't think it would be cumulative. And uh, you know, things are slowing down a bit for the Chinese, also because of foreign exchange. They've made a lot of bad bets. You know, a lot of the investments they've done overseas haven't panned out. And that's another reason why I think actually more foreign companies will come to China because it's easier to be successful here. Well, I'm not here, but if I was in China, I was here. It's easier than trying to run something overseas. And uh, Daniel's question is, what is the best way to manage the record keeping of messages and document sending when WeChat is the more popular platform for China teams rather than email? Yeah, that's not easy. But I think the good thing about WeChat is if we're talking about a joint venture, so we've got WeChat work, um, which I never really use, but our law firm uses WeChat work. And I think they can keep a record of everything and they can stop things and block things. But even in a, say if it's a joint venture dispute, so if Steve was engaging in WeChats with his Chinese counterpart, you know, on his phone at least, 
you'll see all the conversations. So it's not always you have to like get the other guy's phone. You just have to find the person he's talking with and you can see how certain pieces of information come together. But I don't think there's any way you can just get the WeChat remotely you know, by getting it in some other way. So does anybody have any more questions? Uh, now's your time to do it. Um, and did Lisa, did he answer your question about Tesla? Or did we answer the question I, about Tesla? I didn't see the question about Tesla. Uh, it was sort of tacked on to uh, Steve's question. Okay. Uh, Tesla, Tesla, Tesla's got a new deal. It's something I wouldn't think was possible, but I think uh, they were allowed to set up 100%. Where like Steve said, it was always 50-50, which they've slightly uh, relaxed. But Tesla, I would have told them it's impossible, but they got it through. So it shows you China is becoming more flexible. And you can even see with the Trump trade war with China, it, it's a bit like SEPA. SEPA is the Hong Kong agreement. And so, you know, we always had in China a list of foreign investment categories, you know, ranging from prohibited to encouraged to permitted to restricted. And, you know, SEPA was for Hong Kong companies Hong Kong companies have better access than anybody else. And then with the trade war, Trump got better access in some areas. And now with the European investment agreement, they will seem to get better access in some areas too. So now it's a little bit, not just what you do, it's where you come from as well. So it's a little bit more. Uh, if there are no more questions uh, on behalf of the FENG. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. It is very simple, Just a, a quick one here. So um, Mark, if you can uh, share maybe your contact information and you know, for those of us who want to reach out to you for potential opportunities to work with, whether it's in uh, in the Zoom chat here or via email, email that'll be great. Thank you, thank you again for sharing, it was great. I really enjoyed it, thank you. Oh, great, thanks for the vote of confidence. And Jay is uh, saying he meant China's the recipient of the most FDI. Oh, that probably happened a lot of times. America never wanted FDI. Uh, I remember the American Commercial Bureau guys back in the, uh, until the 2000s, they were always surprised if they ever thought they were supposed to ask Chinese to invest in America, because they always said, America, we invest in other countries, but other countries shouldn't invest in us, they should just go away. So I think <laughs> Americans were never too keen on foreign, it was at least my, uh, my uh, understanding of the American uh, perspective. So did you want to take a minute and add your, uh, Mark, add your information into the chat? There you I go. just added an email address. And I'll even, like, since Lisa mentioned it, I'll just quickly put in our YouTube channel. If people wants to find it. I'd be very excited. Well, it makes me happy if people have a look at what we've got on there. So Daniel asked me to uh, do the the exit here uh, because of his internet problems. So uh, on behalf of our chapter chairs uh, and the FENG, Mark, we really want to thank you very much for this very informative talk. Um, it is being recorded, so I will send this the Zoom link out to everybody who's on the call as well as the people who registered later today. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Um, I also want to thank our members in China who stayed up so late <laughs> for this. Um, and also to thank our chairs, because without Jay, who's sitting in an airport, and Daniel, who's up till 1 a.m., uh, we, we couldn't operate. The thing is really based, you know, we need our volunteers, we need our members, so thank you to everybody, and um, just please check back on the new, the new website, which is up and running for uh, next time's, next, uh, the next meeting for Shanghai. So if anybody has anything else they'd like to say, um, last chance. Otherwise, thank you, uh, Ken, one, Mark. Sure. Uh, just one quick question, um, Charlotte. Um, Mark, um, it might be a silly question, but um, would, I, would I be right in thinking that apart from a few exceptions that you just mentioned, that if you wanted to trade with China, you would basically have to go through a joint venture route rather than having a 100% owned um, company? No, I know. I think it's uh, uh, it's it really was never like that. Even in the early '90s, there was always lots of exceptions. Uh, but I'd say, yeah, at a guess, ninety-five percent of the clients we have could do it as a wholly foreign enterprise. There's only narrow 
bands. You know, if it's something with telco, financial institutions, um, something like electronic mapping, uh, I don't know, rare earth exploitation or something, uh, certain types of diesel engines. So really, probably 95% of stuff you can do as a woofie. So I think there's some who do it because of legal reasons. Then there's a bunch who do it because um, they like the Chinese partner. And then there are some who just think this will get me the market access. This is the way to do it. So I, that is something really worth, uh, thanks for mentioning because you know, sometimes I, I don't realize that people don't realize it. China is very open actually to companies. So for 90% of the companies out there, they can set up their own wholly foreign owned enterprise. Okay, thanks for that question. Now this really is the last chance <laughs> for any questions. If not, well, thank you again to everybody for joining us and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, evening and see you soon. Thanks again.